So we're going to be talking about Leviticus 23 for the next couple of weeks. And you've been studying the first three feasts in what is a series of seven feasts in Leviticus 23. And we're going to be talking about that and its significance, its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. We've been talking about how every single page contains Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And so today we're going to be talking the gospel in food, the gospel in parties, and in types, in pictures, and shadows. And so welcome. This is Study Through the Bible, where we study the Bible in community here on YouTube. And so if you're new to the channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future content. You can study along with us. The study descriptions, the daily study assignments are in the description down below. And you can also catch our links to go back to the beginning of Leviticus, the beginning of Genesis and Exodus as well. So welcome. We're glad that you're here with us. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Exodus 12 to this month shall be unto you. And I keep, I don't know why it keeps doing that, but... All right, <clears throat> so let's go back. Leviticus 23, 5. In the 14th day of the first month at even, evening is the Lord's Passover. And so this is the first of seven uh, feasts that we're going to encounter in the, the chapter of Leviticus 23. And three of those are going to be mandatory. They are every able-bodied Jewish person that is supposed to and mandated to come down to Jerusalem. And that's, of course, once they get into the promised land. Right now, they're all together in the wilderness when this comes about. But when they get into the promised land, every able-bodied Jew is to go down to Jerusalem for these three feasts. And that becomes important when we get into the Gospels and we see how Jews, Jesus utilized these feasts for his ministry and how God actually ultimately utilized these feasts as we're going to get into next week when we talk about Pentecost. <clears throat> so these feasts all have significance that have to do with the past and then they celebrate it in the present looking forward to the future. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. So the first of those feasts and really, it, it's one feast that kind of blends into these first three feasts all together, and that is Passover. And of course, Passover was the 14th of Nisan, which and in their previous calendar, we're going to get into this in a second, it was, you know, in a certain month, I think uh, the fifth month, if I remember that correctly, but um, no, 14th day of the first month. At evening is the Lord's Passover. Okay, so Passover is obviously looking back to when they came out of Egypt and God redeemed them out of slavery. And so they were to celebrate Passover by uh, slaughtering a, an innocent, you know, firstborn animal and taking its blood, applying it to the doorpost of their house and that was to symbolize the blood of Jesus, who is the innocent lamb, the one without any broken bones, the one without any blemish, the one who would ultimately save us from our sin and from our slavery to sin, death, and hell. And so they would apply that um, to their doorpost. They would eat all of the, the flesh, all of the, the meat of the animal. Nothing was supposed to remain left over till the morning. And so Passover is ultimately clearly, clearly pointing towards the death of the Messiah, the one who was to take away our sins. John the Baptist, when Jesus comes along, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so Jesus, um, just so you know, prophetically, Jesus, the, when they were inspecting the lambs to be sacrificed, Jesus was standing trial. When they were uh, killing them in preparation, he was on the cross. And then, you know, then he is the Passover fulfillment. Very literally, um, he is the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But in a larger picture, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about the gospel. 
of Jesus Christ, okay? And I'm going to get very clearly and very show you very specifically if you wonder what exactly is the gospel. Well, first of all, if you're a Christian and you're watching this, that's kind of an odd question to ask. I, you know, I, I'm always blown away by how many Christians, if you ask them what the gospel is, they, they aren't sure what it is. But that's the very gospel by which, by definition, they should believe in order to put their whole trust in, in Jesus and what he has done for us in order to have their sins forgiven. So it's kind of an oxymoron to say, I'm a Christian, but I don't know what the gospel is. So we're going to take care of that by the end of it. And you may find by the time we get done with this that, you know, you say I'm a Christian, but now you finally understand and know what a Christian is and what they believe. And you're able to actually put your trust in the gospel. So I hope that's the case. Let us know if it is. So let's go on. And so one of the things about Passover is that they had a previous, you know, civil calendar. And that was the, you know, the calendar that was kind of ticking all the way through the, the history, their history prior to this. But then when God institutes Passover, here's what he says in Exodus 12, verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And so previously, it fell in a different place on the calendar. And, you know, I could have showed you, you know, how that works. But so they had a civil calendar and they have a religious calendar. And sometimes that's going to come into play as you're studying the Bible um, to understand that sometimes it very seldom, but sometimes it re refers to the civil calendar and then sometimes it's referring to the religious calendar. But this is basically God saying this is a new beginning. This is a new start. And, you know, coincidence, you know, again, we happen to be in the month of December. So very soon, a couple of weeks, we're going to be hitting Christmas and then we're going to be hitting the new year. And everybody looks to the new year as new possibilities. And you know, I've never really personally understood this because, you know, in Christ, you have the ability every single day when you get off the pillow, you have a new start. Whatever happened the previous day, whatever sin you gave into, whatever went wrong, whatever struggles, whatever, you know, mistakes, every day there is a new beginning. His mercies are new every morning. And so, Honestly, the best time, because another thing that happens in the new year is everybody not only looks to the new beginnings, but then that means that suddenly all the things that they've said that they want to do, that they're going to make sure that happens. We call those New Year's resolutions. And again, if God's calling you to something, whether that's a sin that he wants to, you know, you to repent of and for you to change in that way, or it's like a healthy habit or discipline or something that you're doing in a relationship with God or your marriage or your physical health or whatever it is, now is the best time to do it. Don't wait. Like, don't say like, okay, I'm going to splurge for the next three months. And then when the first of the year comes, then I'm going to have this new start. And I'm going to totally do, start handling my, my money differently, my time differently. I'm going to spend more time with my kids. If God's calling you to do something and he's convicting you and he's putting that on you, now is the time to do that. Okay. So this Passover, which points towards Jesus being the, the, his death on the cross as a way of forgiving our sins, it symbolizes the new beginning that we have in Jesus Christ, okay? The new beginning that God gives us and that brings new mercies every morning. And so now an application of Passover and one of those things in the Gospels, it happened to be on Passover in John chapter 2 verse 15. And it says, and when he had made a scourge, a small cord. So Jesus comes into the temple and he's there to observe what's going on as Passover. So you have all of those people, like I said, every able bodied Jew is coming down to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And so they're going to the temple, they're bringing their offerings, they're bringing their sacrifices, and what, do they, what does Jesus see? He sees them selling uh, offerings that are approved by their guys, right? So people would bring an offering, their guys would inspect it and say, like, no, this is no good, and, you know, we'll take that off your hands. Now we have one that we can sell you that's already been inspected and approved. And, of course, there was a lot of shady stuff going on there, and they were just really just 
gouging God's people who were trying to do the right thing with a lot of a lot of high prices to do the right thing. Okay, so Jesus it says when he had made a course. A scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen to pour out the changers' money over through the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things from here and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And this is bigger. An application is money, okay? That, you know, the last thing in the world we want, would want to do as a church or as a ministry is to just constantly be putting stuff out there at high prices and trying to get people to um, purchase things and, you know, purchase things at higher value, you know, than, and really trying to take advantage of God's people, okay? That's the last thing in the world we'd want to do as a ministry. In fact, my ministry for the longest time is called People the Free Gift, right? And... For the longest time, I was stubbornly trying to refuse to charge people money for anything. And then what happened, the transition that is that I wrote a book that cost me a whole lot to produce and I just started trying to make my money back and you kind of have to have pay, it list a price. You can't just like put something on Amazon and for free of charge kind of thing, okay? So... I, I did that, and it kind of turned a corner, but what I noticed is, is intrinsic in people is that they want to pay something. If you don't charge people something, then they don't put any value on it. And so while I was trying to live out what Jesus taught, because I all honestly feel like this is his intention and what his ideal is for money, freely you have received, freely give. I wanted to freely give these things out and then people be able to freely give to my ministry. Okay, well, what I found is that um, people don't show any interest in something you're not charging for, and it really turns into them, you know, giving on the other end if they're just taking from you, okay? So anyway, that's a long, you know, rabbit trail just to talk about one application of this, okay? But deeper than that is motive. Okay, these guys had a really impure motive. Their motive was to gouge God's people out of finances and take advantage of the fact that they were coming for the feast, coming for the, the, the offering, coming to God's house. And Jesus got really ticked off about that, okay? But other motives, you know, Jesus pointed to the Pharisees who would go on the street corners and they would give, but then they would blow a trumpet, you know? That always really annoys me, you know? Have you, have you ever noticed that, like, businesses are making it more of a common practice? You go to the cashier and then they say, oh, do you want to donate, you know, something to this, this thing? And occasionally it's something that you want to donate to. And then, they, like, inevitably... After I say yes, then they're like ringing some kind of bell or blowing a horn or doing, you know, like hitting some kind of button with a sound effect to let people know that I just, you know, donated something to this ministry. And that always like gets under my skin because Jesus said, don't do that for that purpose. Now, just because they do that and they acknowledge you, and even if they acknowledge you kind of awkwardly like that, it doesn't take away your reward because what Jesus was pointing to is their motive, their heart. The reason why they were doing it is so that they would get the praise of men, okay? So we can do things for God, but have a horrible motive and reason why we're doing it, okay? The, the right reason is to do it the same reason that Paul says the love of Christ compels us. Compel meaning like it, it actually forces us to do something. It, it, it drives us to do what we do. It is the reason why we do what we do. The love of Christ, his love in us and our love for him compels us to do what we're doing for him. Okay? And it, unless... That and that's what I'm trying to get across, okay? Trying to get across in, in our church is I don't want you to give unless you want to give. I don't want you to show up unless you want to show up. I don't want you to read your Bible and you want you want to read your Bible. I don't want less. I don't want you doing these things just because you feel like you have to because somebody's watching you because. You might get God's blessing if you do it, okay? Those are all bad reasons to do things for God. 
And so if we don't have to have, if we don't have anybody who wants to work with children, we're not going to have a children's ministry. If we don't have anybody who wants to show up to church, our church shuts down, okay? Period. That's just the end of the discussion, okay? Because I want to drive across that we're not here because we should, because we ought to, because we have to. We're here and we do what we do because we love him and because he loves us and because his love through, flows through us, okay? So that's just my heart and I believe that that's the way that it should be. And so Jesus is just bringing that out and he's chastising these guys because your motive's impure and you're taking advantage of these poor guys, okay? So moving on to the second feast, okay? And this is an extension of the first feast, Passover, okay? They celebrate Passover, that's one day. And so then for the rest of that week through the next, until the next Sabbath, okay, that is, they're going to continue this Feast of Unleavened Bread, which symbolizes the burial of Jesus Christ with aspects that point back to his death, okay? Leviticus 23, 6, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And so... That, that's just the details of it, and the main point of it, the main highlight, the main emphasis of it is the unleavened bread, okay? And that is pointing forward to the Messiah who would be without sin, without fault. There is absolutely nothing of darkness in him, okay? He's clothed in humanity. He perfectly, he was tempted in every way, yet knew no sin. And the Apostle Paul says, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, but the reason why this points towards his burial is because after Jesus died, that body, which Jesus said, you know, take, eat, this is my body, the bread, the unleavened bread, this is my body broken for you. And really cool, like when, if you're celebrating Passover, you know, and the, the Jews do this too, but they don't even know why they do it. They have three different things of unleavened bread. And in the middle, the middle one is wrapped in a cloth and it's broken in half. Okay. And then it's tucked away. Why do you think that is? They, they don't even know why they do it. But it seems very clear that all of that is just pointing forward. It's just symbolic of Jesus and how he died for our sins and then he was buried. And this is one of those parts of the gospel, what's included in the gospel, which we'll get to in a minute, is that it's not really emphasized. We talk about the death, we talk about the resurrection, but the, the burial, okay? And so there was a proper way in which he was supposed to be buried, in which case, in normal circumstances, Jesus being crucified by Romans should not have had the burial that he had. It took Joseph of Arimathea, who was one of the Pharisees who actually was on the council when they condemned him to death, then he reveals, I actually believe in Jesus. I believe that he's the Messiah. And he comes out in a very public way. He comes to Pontius Pilate, the Roman you know, governor who was responsible for Jesus' death, and he asks permission to have the body and bury him in his family's tomb. Okay, and that's what you know as the garden tomb, that's the empty tomb and everything else. There would be no empty tomb if it weren't for Joseph of Arimathea. There wouldn't have been a proper burial if it wasn't for Joseph of Arimathea. There would be a little re evidence of the resurrection happening if it weren't for Joseph of Arimathea. So God used him in a very particular and important way. The other thing, though, when it says unleavened bread, leaven is used throughout Scripture as a type of sin. And the reason why it works so well is, is a, a vivid picture. How does leaven work? Leaven is basically yeast in our world. So you put a little leaven, Paul says, and it leavens the whole lump. Okay, that's what gives uh, bread its, you know, airiness and, it, it, you know, and so unleavened bread is flat. It's like more like what we know as a cracker in the non-Jewish world, right? And so 
Leaven is a type of sin. And so God is adamant in this feast, which is going to be different when we get to the Feast of Pentecost. So stay tuned next week for that. But leaven is a type of sin. And God is very adamant. I don't want any sin. I don't want any leaven. And so it's pointing towards the sinlessness of Jesus. But the sinlessness of Jesus is what makes the sacrifice effective on our behalf. And it's what allows Jesus to not stay in that tomb. And the apostles, they quote the Old Testament, which says, you know, death could not hold him. Okay, you have not abandoned my soul to Hades or to Sheol, okay, in the Hebrew. You have not abandoned my soul to Sheol, to Hades, because death could not hold him. Okay, he was sinless, so there was no claim on his soul. There was no claim on him by the evil one. And so because of that, he was able to pay for our sins and yet rise again from the dead on the third day, which we're going to get to is the next element in a little bit. Okay, right now. Okay, first fruits. <laughs> Leviticus 23.10, to speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, when you be come into the land which I shall give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. And so a little while ago, and in fact, all three of these feasts, when we are in Exodus, we talked about all of them, okay? And we talked about how first fruits is symbolic of God's principle that you give him your first, your best, and that is a very wise thing. We talked about how if there's anything you want to accomplish, then putting that at the top of your priority list, which means the top of your schedule and the top of your pocketbook, okay, that's the way you get things done. And God knows this, the IRS knows it, and it's a wisdom that you bring him, you know, your best. And as Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of the, these things will be added unto you, okay? So we talked about that element of first fruits, but we didn't talk about how first fruits is a picture of the resurrection. First of all, it happened during harvest time, okay? And so it happened during harvest time, and so that's when they're reaping the crops. It's the new life that's coming up, okay? And so you have it during harvest time. But then you also have it, um, and, and so he's saying, I want you to give the first of that, okay? But in the New Testament, it says very clearly that Jesus is our first fruits of the resurrection, so because Jesus resurrected first, all of us are going to be able to resurrect, okay? So, and it's just a matter of where you're going to resurrect to. See, if you resurrect, meaning your soul being eternal, if you go before God and you still have sin that has not been dealt with, then you're going to be resurrected and eternal in a state of complete separation from God in a place that we call hell. If you have put your trust in the sacrifice of Jesus, the Messiah, and you have accepted his offer to forgive your sins and accepted his offer of eternal life, then you put your, your complete and total trust in him, then you will spend eternity with God, dwelling with God. And that's in a place we call heaven, okay? So first fruits is a picture of the resurrection. And so let's get a little bit more into this. First Corinthians 15, Paul is addressing a problem in the Corinthian church with some of the people who were teaching that Jesus did not physically and or did not bodily rise from the dead. Okay, these could have been Jewish people who did not believe in a resurrection, Sadducees perhaps, or it could have been Gnostics um, that were in the church and influenced by Gnosticism, and they didn't believe that Jesus physically resurrected from the dead. And there's certain groups in our day who teach that Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead, but rather he rose spiritually in the hearts and the minds of his believers, okay? 
And that's exactly not the case. Paul is emphatic about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how do you some among you that there is, say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Okay? So the first thing he says is, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain. And then he says, your faith is vain. Yea, and we are found foul, false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he has not raised up. If so, the dead be not risen. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are still in your sins. This, that statement right there is the reason why I say there's a handful of things that the Bible says that you must believe in order to call yourself a Christian, in order to have a relationship with God, in order to have your sins forgiven. And this is one of them, that believing that Jesus physically and bodily rose from the dead after three days. Paul says, if you don't believe that, then you are still in your sins. Then they also, which have fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. So now we got into number six consequence, okay? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that kind of shatters the whole health and wealth gospel right there because they say that, you know, this is the best life to live, that you are going to be prosperous, you're going to be healthy, and that God wants that for your life, and you're going to have this abundant life here and now in this life. And Paul says, no, that's not the case. If we only have heaven, and we, if we only have this life and we don't have heaven, I mean, then we are above all men to be most pitied. Okay, that shatters that whole thing. Being a Christian means sacrifice. Being a Christian means living for eternity and sacrificing the here and now. Now, there, it's not wrong to have money and be a Christian. It's not wrong to have an abundance and be a Christian. It's not wrong, but it's also not promised. And it's not wrong to be poor and be a Christian or to be disadvantaged in any way, shape, or form and be a Christian. If that is what God designs for you in this life, Again, this, it's not about this life. It's about living for the next life. So whatever he happens to give us in this life is, is on top of that. It, it's, it's abundant. But I have found that oftentimes it's not the stuff. It, it's not any of that that brings the biggest blessing in this life. It's the spiritual stuff. It's, it's experiencing God in the closeness that you have with him. It's the times where you get the opportunity to be a blessing in other people's lives. It's the time when you get to show his love. It's the time when you get to be there when somebody actually comes into a relationship with God and be a part of that. That is oftentimes the biggest blessing that I found in this life. 1 Corinthians 15, 35, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? So here's another question, and it was raised as an objection. Well, if there's a resurrection, then, you know, how are they going to be raised up? What kind of body are they going to have? Okay, so he's addressing this, and he says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so Paul is saying that there will be a physical resurrection. Just like Jesus physically, bodily rose from the dead after three days, the apostle Paul and John also say, we shall be like him, and we, for we shall see him as he is, okay? And so Paul is saying that it's not 
like, you know, you sow this body into the ground and this body comes out on the other end. He's saying you sow this body into the ground and this is the natural body and then a physical, a spiritual body, which is still physical, but is spiritual, just like Jesus' body after he rose from the dead. It has physical aspects, but it also is spiritual. Okay, it's not the same as his body he walked around with for three years, and it's not even the same body that he ends up with after he's ascended and he's sitting at the right hand of God. Okay, but this body, which is sown in weakness, is raised in power and strength. This body, which has weakness and corruption, is raised incorruptible. This body, which has sin, is raised in glory. Okay, so we shall be risen with him. And in fact, the beginning of that, Paul says, that we have died with him, we're risen with him, we already have newness of life. But when we die or when he comes for his church, then we shall be risen with him. And resurrection just doesn't mean risen from the dead. It means a completely new body. I mean, so you think caterpillar into butterfly. You think, um, like Paul says, you, you sow a seed and it raises up as a plant, okay? One body goes into the ground and another one comes out of it, okay? So that is the resurrection, and 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you were saved. If you keep in memory that I, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered you unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to to the scriptures. So this is what we've been talking about all along, except we've been talking about it in the feast that God gave Israel back in the Old Testament, which pointed back to real events that really happened to the Israelites that they celebrated present tense all throughout their history and even unto today, and they pointed forward to the Messiah that was to come. And they, they point to the death burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. And they were fulfilled on the day of Passover and then unleavened bread up until that Sunday morning, which was the Feast of first fruits. Okay, so Paul says, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is one of those scriptures he's talking about. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. That's the good news that we can go about and we can tell people, okay? And so they need to believe that there is one God, that Jesus is God, that Jesus was in human flesh, and that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And that was physically and bodily he rose again from the dead and that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone to the glory of God alone. And so if you've never believed that, now is as good a time as ever to believe that. And if, you'd, and if you want help with that, you have questions about that, comment down below. I'd love to help you with that and be a part of that for you. But it's as easy as you, between you and God, in your own words, wherever you are, just acknowledging I am a sinner, but I confess my sins to you, and I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and he rose again from the dead, and I ask you to forgive me and come into my life and change me from the inside out. It's not the words that you say. It's where your heart is. Do you really believe it? Are you really putting your ent complete entire trust in Jesus and ready to, to, ready to confess your sins to him? And that's what it's about, and that's the gospel. And so if you accepted the gospel, let me know. I would love to be a part of that. I would love to help you out and get, help you out with your first steps in that journey. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, let me ask you this. When is the last time you got a chance to share it? And if you say, you know what, I hardly ever have a chance to share it, okay? When is the last time that you prayed for the opportunity to share the gospel? When is the last time that you strategically put in front of you a list of people that you know and prayed for 
their salvation and prayed that if God wants to use you, that you would have an opportunity to be a part of that. And so that's a challenge I put out before you. And so how is God calling you to grow from this in your understanding of the gospel, sharing the gospel, defending the gospel, your motive in ministry, giving God your best, putting on incorruption, glory, and power. I want to know what God's doing in your life. Comment in the down below. And also, if you have questions or insights that I didn't point out in today's uh, lesson, then put those in the comments. I'll be choosing some for next week's Q&A videos. And um, if you haven't subscribed already, do that so you don't miss any future content. If you go in the descriptions of this video, you'll find the weekly assignments that you can follow so that you can uh, follow along in your Bible Day, on a daily basis, and then come back every week for these weekly videos, and then join the community, put your comments down below, and comment on other people, help them out. Let's do this in community here on YouTube. That's what this channel is all about. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.